Hello to everyone and welcome to this session on citizen science, artificial intelligence and algorithms. Um, the session will last one hour and we have quite a, um, a few uh, speakers that will join us uh, on the stage. Uh, my name is Marta Mazzonetto. I am project manager at the European Citizen Science Association and I'm going to be the chair of this session. Um, as you will see, uh, we will try and have as much interaction as possible with all of you. We, uh, we have planned a few activities that we would like to do together. So keep, keep finger crossed with us that everything will work well technology-wise. I'm sure that everything will go fine. Um, but first of all, I would like to introduce the panelists that are in the session today that are on the screen with me. Um, we have... Um, um, sorry, I have a mistake here. Okay, sorry. Uh, so we have um, five person uh, with me uh, today in the session. Uh, there is uh, right next to me Marisa Ponti, assistant professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Sven Schade, who is policy officer at the JRC in Ispra in Italy. Frank Osterman, assistant professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Lor, Lor is not there, so no Lor, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Grant Miller, communications and project manager at Zooniverse. So welcome to all the speakers. Um, oh. we, no further ado, I think we can yeah. jump right into the first step of this session. Oh, welcome Lor. I see Lor has also uh, joined us. So, Laure uh, Klotze from uh, Assistant Professor at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. So, welcome, Laure. Um, so, I think uh, I can invite uh, Marisa Ponti here on the screen with me. Uh, to start this session in a very interactive way, Marisa has planned a poll that we are going to launch soon, uh, where, first of all, we would like to uh, ask for your opinion on the core topic of this session, isn't it, Marisa? Uh, thank you, Martia. Yes, let's start with the poll. So uh, I would like um, the control room to send the first poll. Uh, I know I don't see it, but people should be able to see it. Uh, while you read and vote, let me explain the purpose of this poll. So we want to spark some discussion on opportunities and risks of using AI in citizen science. So we use two statements. One is about what we consider an opportunity, and the other one is about what we consider to be a risk. So the first statement is about what we perceive as an opportunity. So right now you should be able to see the first statement. The use of AI, machine learning, can result in the democratization of research, as labor-intensive and routine tasks can be carried out by machines. So we would like to hear from you and see whether you agree or disagree. Uh, or if you don't have an opinion, you just say you, that you don't know. It is possible also to, uh, to express comments uh, in the chat also, so please control room, uh, send a link to the Google Doc in, uh, in the chat where people can uh, write comments uh, either during the session or at the end of the session, uh, tomorrow <laughs> or when you, when you feel like. Uh, once we have the results, can you Please, control room, share the results with us. Um, Marta? We don't have the results yet. Just a second, ah. just a, a little bit more of suspense. We need to allow okay. a bit more time for people to answer because there is a little bit of delay between when we Absolutely. speak and... So Absolutely. let's uh, let's uh, create more suspense while we wait. And uh, so, in the meanwhile, I also remind uh, the control room uh, to if if they can post in the chat the link to the Google Doc. And the Google Doc is 
mostly to add comments to to elaborate on your answer so as you see the poll is agree disagree maybe but in the google doc you can of course elaborate more we would really like for you to uh, write comments and elaborate more on your answers and if exactly. you don't want to do it on the Google Doc, because maybe you are on a phone or it's not easy for you to access the Google Doc, of course, you can also do it uh, in the chat. And we will be taking all your comments into account. We have a long time for chatting together towards the end of the session. So we do have some results now, Marisa. So yes. we have 13% of uh, participants that agree with the answer, so 13. We have 35% of uh, the person who answered uh, who, who disagree with the statement and 45% who don't know. Okay. And, and I think uh, some people are also answering through the Google Doc. So let me have a look ah. there. I see a lot of people adding some, maybe they just connected now, so they are still trying to let us know well, uh, their point of view. But definitely, I would say that the don't know is the highest. So we have around 45, 46% of answers on don't know, 35% on disagree, and only 13% on agree. Uh, uh, Frank here says that we um, it's better not to vote in the Google Doc. So that, that must be really clear. The Google Doc should be used to write comments and elaborate further on uh, on whether you agree or disagree or you don't know. But please don't vote in the Google Doc. Otherwise, we cannot uh, collect uh, collect it as um, as part of the results. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, send the first, uh, the second poll now. So please, control room, send the second poll. Uh, the second poll is a second and last statement about what we perceive as a risk. And uh, so it says the use of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning can reduce accountability. So who can be held responsible, uh, for example, for problematic and discriminatory outcomes? Uh, uh, research designers, algorithm developers, programmers uh, or untrained contributors. That's what we meant by uh, saying that uh, the use of AI can reduce accountability. So while you vote, uh, while you read and vote, uh, just a, a clarification here. These uh, statements are not factual. They don't refer to undeniable truth, but they really reflect the complexity of some issues raised by the use of artificial intelligence in citizen science. And that's why, of course, uh, there can be a lot of disagreement on that. <clears throat> uh, when, While we uh, wait, when... so normally now you are seeing the, the poll uh, on the screen. So please answer to the poll that you see on the screen, possibly, and not on the Google document, please. And in the meantime, maybe we can, uh, while we wait for people to vote uh, on this, on the, directly on the screen, um, we can, I can mention that uh, one of our participants, Luigi, just wrote asking if maybe there is an artificial intelligence managing the uh, uh, survey. Of course, I guess it's a joke, but it's quite interesting since the results so far seems to be quite uh, interesting and maybe not what you were expecting. I'm sure we will have time to comment on this at the end of the... Um, um, at the end I of the... Uh, Marcia? Yes. Uh, it looks like uh, um, I see a comment here. The questions uh, are the wrong way around. Uh, since I don't see it, uh, ah, it looks like uh, there was a confusion, the opportunity. Uh, so I see the statement that was supposed to be an opportunity came as a risk and vice versa. <clears throat> um, mm -mm. So the issue was that the questions were swapped. So that's uh, ah yes, I'm so you're right. <laughs> there was a confusion here. Well, <laughs> it happens. You're right. 
Indeed, we started with the second question. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, no problem. I didn't, I didn't see the questions, and so I, I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, no problem. So now I'm going to read the question as it's in on the screen now. The use of artificial intelligence and machine learning will result in the in the democratization of mm -hmm. research, as routine tasks can be carried out by machines. So this is the that was question. that that was supposed to be the pro, the opportunity, and the other one yes. is supposed to be the risk. <laughs> yes, definitely humans behind the scene. <laughs> But it's okay. So let's wait uh, just a little bit more to get um, as many answers as possible. Let's wait maybe 10 more seconds. So people are voting. Thank yes. you for your for your patience and uh... and I of course please do write comments. I see some people are already writing comments there to elaborate their answers. That's fantastic. So please do write comments and thoughts there. Okay, shall we, what do you think, Marisa? Shall we wait a bit sure. longer or close it? No, let's close it. <clears throat> no, maybe let's give 10 more seconds. Okay. A little bit more of suspense. I could see, Marisa, you were quite surprised by the results we got before, so something was not going <laughs> as expected. Yeah, it's okay. It doesn't matter. So that's uh, <clears throat> okay. We have the results of the poll uh, now. So let's remind to all that the question is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning will result in the democratization of research as routine tasks can be carried out by machines. And the answers are 29% agree. 44% disagree and 26% don't know, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, Unless these are the results of the first poll. No, they are the results of the current poll. So 29% agree, 44% disagree and 26% don't know. Do you have any more comments, Marisa, on the poll, or shall we move on no. to the first presentation? No, I don't, I, I don't have. A, a, I can see here that Manuel Portela suggests that we um, we we added another button. It depends. I mean, it's perfectly correct that we didn't think about it. So, well, <laughs> I guess that. It, uh, this can be reflected in the in, in the comments if people want to want to argue more about the, their their responses. <clears throat> okay, so maybe we can put on hold the poll and please mm -hmm. do keep uh, write your comments um in the google document but uh, before we go into discussing the outcomes of the poll we actually have one headline talk for this session uh, so i would like to invite on the screen uh, our um, uh, speaker for the headline talk grant miller uh, who is going to talk about can we all just get along hybrid human machine approaches to citizen science in zooniverse I still see Marisa, so maybe if we can switch to uh, grants, then um, we can have the first talk. And then we will, no worries, we will go back. Hey, Grants, welcome. Hey. We will go back to the um, 
poll uh, to discussing all together the outcomes of the poll uh, with all the uh, participants. So, uh, Gant, please um, welcome. And uh, now is uh, to you to present your talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Hi from sunny London. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm just going to see if I can share my screen here so you should be able to see my slides. Here we go. And up here, and I'll start presenting. So, yes, um, thank you to Marisa, especially for organizing this session and for inviting me to give a, a talk about some of the work we've been doing regarding AI and machine learning at the Zooniverse. Um, <clears throat> to help kind of frame this session and frame the discussions and the and the comments that are coming on regarding the poll questions as well. Um, I actually wrote the title of this talk uh, probably at, at the end of 2019, and it just seems uh, more pertinent <laughs> every day. But the, the title is, Can We All Just Get Along? And I'm really going to be talking about how machines and humans are working uh, side by side and together in various different ways. Uh, on the Zooniverse platform to give you an idea of, of existing um, machine learning and AI integration in, in online citizen science. I'm just going to hide that there. OK. I'm going to start by presenting one of our most popular uh, citizen science projects, that's Planet Hunters Test, and explaining a bit of the traditional kind of route uh, of machine involvement in, in, in our citizen science projects. Um, Planet Hunters TESS is uh, an astronomy project where we are getting members of the public to help look for planets around other stars. Um, so in this case, they're looking at quite quite boring graphs, quite dry graphs. Well, they're exciting to me, but maybe boring to others. Um, uh, these graphs are the plot of the brightness of a star over time. And the key is that uh, the star's brightness will change for various reasons. One of those reasons is if a planet passes in front, there'll be a dip in brightness, just as the planet blocks some of the light from that star. So we're putting up these light curves, as they're called, these graphs, and asking for members of the public to look for these dips in brightness. Now, machines are actually already involved in this work, as they are with almost all fields of astronomy. Um, what happens in the Planet Hunters case is the machines actually have the first go, because it's Quite a simple problem when you, when you boil it down. They're just looking for a repeating dip in, in a graph. And, and machines are actually quite good at that. Now, they do do a really good job, and they do recover a lot of these planets. But the interesting thing is, from a citizen science point of view, the machines get nowhere near to completeness. There's many different things that can trip a machine up while looking for planet dips in these graphs. So that's why, even though uh, NASA and other, other groups are looking at this data first with machines are finding a lot of planets, we still have this opportunity to present these uh, data to volunteers and get, get find even more planets uh, through human interaction. Uh, one kind of famous example from planet hunters of the type of planet we find are ones where there's only a single dip. Uh, this is an example here, the planet here just uh, uh, passing in front of the star. So there's only one dip and we didn't look at that star long enough to see the planet come around again. Machines are looking for a repeating signal, and they quite often get tripped up and don't find these planets, whereas a human can look at a single dip and say, OK, that looks great. Um, also, unexpected findings, things that we wouldn't even know what they looked like. The first ever planet discovered on Planet Hunters was the first ever planet to be discovered with four stars. So unlike our system, where we've just got the one sun and all the planets going around, this planet was actually in a system with four different suns, four stars. And it had a very strange light curve, but our human volunteers were able to spot that right away where the machines were missing it. And this plot here shows you uh, the kind of planets that are being found by humans on Planet Hunters TESS compared to the black dots that are the planets being found by the machine algorithms, and how actually they're complementary. They fill out a different area of the parameter space. And then even more fantastic things happen when you bring humans into the loop uh, to look through data like this, when they start to do things that you didn't ask them to do necessarily. Um, this is actually from a paper produced by an amateur volunteer on, on Planet Hunters who started looking for these kind of dips, which aren't caused by planets, 
they're caused by comets. These are comets passing in front of stars. So this wasn't the initial research question of the project. No one asked this volunteer to go and look for these, but they started finding them and then turned it into a scientific publication. That's something that uh, humans can do in a very amazing way, but machines are still not quite there. The machine goes away and does exactly kind of what you ask of it, even if it doesn't always seem like that. So that was just a way of framing kind of the traditional approach on Zooniverse projects. You know, machines always, uh, especially in astronomy projects, have a first goal, but there's quite often the case where there's a lot of data that the machine can't get complete, and we can put that online and ask for human help. The next stage of bringing machines into the loop on Zooniverse projects involves taking the annotations that humans are making, taking those decisions and those answers, and trying to use that to train uh, a machine learning algorithm. This is a very traditional way of training taking a large amount of annotated data and training a machine to try and perform the task at a similar level as the humans. Um, one of the biggest projects we're doing this on is, is our Penguin Watch project, where we're getting volunteers to look at images from Antarctica at penguin nest sites and just click uh, and count all the penguins that they see. And by clicking on them, they're also marking exactly where in the image those penguins are so that we can take that data and feed it into machine learning algorithms and try and train them to, um, to spot penguins. And after five years of this project running and, and producing millions of annotated images, the machines are getting close to being able to mark the penguins in very nice, clear images, though the humans are still much faster and better at this task for uh, kind of more blurry or dark images. Um, so, uh, I'll, sorry, I'll just move on to uh, another example of this that, that I really like, which is from uh, our plastic tide project. Uh, this research team was flying drones over beaches in the United Kingdom and, and further afield and looking for plastics on the beach. The task for our human volunteers was to look at these um, millions of images and draw a box around the plastics that they saw and then label what type of plastic it was. And from the offset, the goal of this project was to train a machine to, to do this as well as the humans because uh, they collect millions of images for, for just a few beaches. So if you really want to monitor more beaches, then it's not feasible to do this just with humans. So you need to quickly train a machine to do this. And one of the, one of the happiest moments of my, of my time at Zooniverse so far was uh, a couple of summers ago, I was at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition and the Plastic Tide research team were there showing off their machine learning algorithm. And they were getting people to come over to their desk and throw down stuff that was in their pockets and various different plastics um, under their camera. And then on the screen here, you were seeing the machine learning algorithm identify those plastics and say what type of plastic they were. And all of that is based on training data from human volunteers on this universe. So that was really exciting to see. So there I've outlined you know, the kind of traditional ways of taking Zooniverse data and, and training up a machine. Um, one, of the, one of the issues about why we really need to bring machines into the loop is around scale. So I've got two examples of scale here that, that I think about a lot about why we need to really argue about machines have to be brought into the loop on, on Zooniverse projects. Um, the first is this telescope here, the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope which is, is kind of in the final stages of being built, it, all going well within the next couple of years, next few years, we should be seeing it take first light, take its first images. The special thing about this telescope is that it's gonna be able to take more images and more data than any other telescope ever built. Uh, it's gonna be able to picture the entire sky once every three nights. It's gonna be taking an unprecedented amount of data. So it doesn't matter how many volunteers we manage to convince to take part in our Zooniverse projects, there's really not enough humans on Earth to help go through this data in the traditional ways that we've been doing already on our astronomy projects. So we need to have something else that can, can help us go through that data. That we need those machines. Another uh, side to the scale argument isn't just the volume of data that's going to be coming into projects, it's how quickly we want to get through that data in certain cases. In the case of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that I showed you there, there will be some data from uh, transient objects, things that are happening really quickly in space that we want to spot quickly. And another good example is um, 
our disaster relief project, the Plan True Response Network. In this case, we're working with first responders around the world that when a natural disaster happens, we can quickly spin up a project within within 24 hours and get satellite data in to help um, identify areas that are in need. You know, for example, road blockages, flooded uh, flooded areas, um, so that we can give these maps to first responders that can help people on the ground. Now, obviously, this needs to happen extremely fast. So, it, in this case, you know, the scale is about how quickly you can get through maybe a small amount of data, but you really need to get through it very fast. So, so machines, if we can bring them in and help get through that data faster, along with the humans, then then that's preferable. Um, so, to me, that is that is the answer. It's not it's not replacing the humans with machines, it's augmenting and bringing machines in to work with humans in a collaboration that can make the projects move even faster and get even more done. Uh, I saw Gary Kasparov speak a couple of years ago in Oxford. He's famous, uh, well, famous for being a great chess grandmaster, but also famous in, in popular culture for being the first chess grandmaster to lose to a computer. Um, but the interesting thing he talked about was um, after that match, there was more that went on into this that wasn't just humans versus computers, but there were matches involving humans and computers versus a computer, or a group of humans versus a machine, or a group of humans and a computer versus a machine. Uh, and, it, and in all the cases that they played, the human and machine working together were able to beat the machine every time in these chess matches. That collaboration between humans and machines was so much, uh, so much better um, at doing the task. We've actually got some data to show this from, from another Astronomy's Universe project. Uh, in, in Supernova Hunters, we were doing the traditional uh, annotating images and, and, and training a machine on looking for these transient objects, these supernova, these exploding stars that appear and then go away over the period of days. Um, and in this project, we ha have some fantastic data that I can actually show you here. Uh, that might be a little confusing to start, but let me just try and convince you that, uh, uh, of, of why this is important. And um, if anyone's in the Google Doc, they can actually see a link to this Supernova Hunters paper if you want to read about this in, in more depth. But I'll just very quickly say that this plot here is showing you um, the red dots are the actual real supernovae that were being identified by humans and machines. On the x-axis is the probability of humans, or, or the confidence of a human thinking that the, the supernova is a real event. And, and on the y-axis, we have the confidence of, of the machine. And the key result here in this plot is that if you were just to take the human uh, 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 confidence and cut it off at say you know 75% or something that you thought was reasonable without including too many false positives um, or you were just to take the machines at say you know 75% confidence and cut out everything else um, then you're going to lose a lot that are identified by the, by the other party here and in fact the key result here is that a combination of the human and machine confidence retrieves a lot more of these of these real events while cutting out the majority of the of the bogus false positives. So that is direct proof that we have the machines and humans working together in a better, more efficient way on, on a Zooniverse project. So the next stage is to how do we bring that in to in the loop on, on a Zooniverse project? And this is the exciting result I want to uh, the exciting work I want to present to you. Uh, uh, that we're doing on, on our Galaxy Zoo project. Now, uh, this isn't the up-to-date Galaxy Zoo website. This is the very first uh, iteration back in 2007. I just like to show it off, and I think it helps explain the problem um, um, really easily. Uh, we just present a galaxy in the middle of the picture here to people, and then we ask, what type of galaxy is it? And people can click a few buttons. Really, there's only two types. There's spiral galaxies and there's elliptical galaxies. And then sometimes you get galaxies crashing into each other and slightly different things. But we really just want people to look at that and click the button. And for since this project launched, we've been trying to train a machine to do this task with, with varying, um, varying success. Uh, What's been deployed now by Mike uh, is this approach of a, a probabilistic Bayesian CNN, a convoluted neural network, um, convolutional neural network that um, you can read a lot more about in the paper that I've linked in the Google Doc if you really want to get into the nitty gritty. But the key work here is to take those galaxy images on the left and try and train up a machine on them. But in this case, not just one model is getting 
um, spit out by by Mike's work, but multiple different um, uh, networks are kind of talking and arguing against each other. And what's being used here is is actually the disagreement between them, especially if uh, if if they're all confident but in disagreement, then that's very interesting. And and the next stage for this is to bring this into the loop on Galaxy Zoo. How do we take you know these these um, these predictions from from Mike's CNN network and actually bring that into the loop on Galaxy Zoo so that the humans are helping train this machine? Um, and this is kind of the novel approach. So what's happening is we've created we've brought this in and made a new workflow on Galaxy Zoo uh, called the enhanced workflow, and this is where the machine comes in and lives. And what's happening here is the machine, when it spits out those results, the galaxies that it is extremely confident about, but all the networks slightly disagree, those are more important than the ones where it's all in agreement. So what we're doing is instead of just getting as many classifications across galaxies to train a machine in the traditional way, we're asking the machine to tell us which ones it's it's it would be more valuable to have more information about. And those galaxies are getting actively thrown back into this enhanced workflow. Every day this is happening. So this is machines in the loop. The machine is learning more every day, but it's spitting back out the ones that it's not so sure about, the ones that it really wants more information on. So we're training on those ones that give the most information rather than just randomly selected galaxies. Uh, to us, it's also very important that we message that we're doing this on a citizen science project, that, that if you're gonna bring machine learning in, it should be um, open and every all the volunteers should know about it. So that was very important to us on Galaxy Zoo. Uh, so we told people when they entered this site what was happening and, and that if they didn't want to help out the machines and work in a machine learning workflow, they could choose the classic workflow on the left there. The really positive result was for us that on Galaxy Zoo, 95% uh, of the volunteers an overwhelming fraction chose to work on the machine learning workflow. And that's a really positive result for us for the future of incorporating machine learning into, into our projects. So just got a last couple of slides here. I'll try and move very quickly. Uh, one of the other cool results is that the, we thought that the Galaxy, uh, that on galaxies with the machine learning algorithms might spit out galaxies that it needs more information on that are quite uh, fuzzy and faint and far away and hard to tell what they are. But actually those aren't the galaxies that it gets most information from. These on the left here are actually the most informative galaxies and they're some of the most interesting ones. So in this case, we're actually uh, giving the volunteers more interesting galaxies and more interesting cases to help train the machine. And that can actually help engage the volunteers even more on that workflow as well. And finally, I just wanna say uh, to reiterate kind of where we started off with, with Planet Hunters, that even when you get these machines learning more and more and more and more, there's still a lot of space left for the volunteers on, on these online citizen science projects. In this universe, we like to phrase one of them as the Zorilla problem. And that comes from our uh, Snapshot Serengeti project, where they have an animal that they're looking for in these camera traps called the Zorilla. Now, the problem is that this kind of rare um, uh, animal that only comes out at night has only been found in two pictures out of six million so far. So how do you train a machine to spot that? It's very hard. But if you show a human two pictures, they'll be able to spot it in other pictures right away. That's why humans are, are just amazing at these kind of pattern recognition tasks. And finally, the thing I came back, uh, talked about earlier, we'll come back to at the end, the most famous example of a kind of serendipitous discovery from Galaxy Zoo is Hanny's Ververp. But the, the thing I want to point out here is that humans don't always do the task you ask them to do. They get inquisitive, uh, they get curious, and they find stuff in data that a machine wouldn't find because the machine wasn't asked to go and look for it. But humans will go and find that and they'll come out with these serendipitous results as well. So there's still plenty of space for humans uh, alongside the machines in these projects, and they can actually produce more uh, together. That's my argument anyway, and thanks very much for listening. Hello, thank you very much, Grant, for your presentation. There are quite a lot of uh, questions for you. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with uh, one um, that... Um, wait, let me just uh, find out where is the file. Okay. Um, 
So Samin is asking about um, feedback that you uh, provide to uh, participants. So um, the, the, there is a question saying, does Zooniverse have a method policy to inform people of the use results of the artificial intelligence that they helped train? Yeah, I mean, in general, we have a policy of informing our volunteers about all results coming out of the project. So. Um, we, we try and make sure we publish completely openly. Um, Mike's paper that I've linked in the Google document there is, is presenting these results. Uh, we blogged about that on the Galaxy Zoo blog. They've been, they've been uh, sent out in newsletters to the volunteers and they're on the Zooniverse publications page, all as open publications. So we, it's very important to us, not only that we inform the volunteers about how and why we're including machine learning in, in the loop on these projects, um, that it's very important that we also show the results of, of how of how that work is working yeah yeah uh, thank you grant and then we have a group of questions so someone raised a quite interesting issue about uh ownership so someone is saying uh well okay zooniverse develops it the participants provide the data and the researcher sets up the project so do you suggest that the model belongs to zooniverse and then also a few people have been commenting on this and uh, they all agree that the question of ownership versus public domain digital commons is a very important one uh, in the context of citizen science so maybe uh, since there have been quite a few questions on this maybe uh, you can elaborate a bit more on this point. That's a very interesting question about who, who owns the model. Um, so I, as, as I said before, we, we try and be as, as open as possible um, with our publications. And that's especially prevalent in the, in the astronomy domain. You know, in this, in this case, um, uh, arguably Mike has, has kind of the main ownership over, over the model that he's helped build, but it has been trained by by the, the volunteers on Zooniverse, it's important for us to, to recognize that. Uh, in Mike's paper, the, the contribution of the volunteers are, are mentioned, again, that, that paper is, is, is openly published. And I, I imagine his code is also open on GitHub. I, I'd, I'd have to check on that, but I think uh, it should be uh, open and available for, for other people to use and for the volunteers themselves to actually have a look at and see, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we have still a couple of minutes for more questions. There is um, uh, someone uh, who is saying, um, so Grant, do you predict uh, that low skill citizen science roles may disappear in the future? And then someone else added, I think this is a really interesting question and it depends on what you mean by low skills. There are things that we might consider low skills, uh, but that doesn't mean that a machine can do it. Uh, I also yeah. find very interesting this question about low skill citizen science roles. It's a really interesting question because a lot of, you know, when we're getting very excited, we start to talk about the machines doing the heavy lifting. And in many cases, that means they're doing the easier work, right? So so the, the, those tasks before that were on Zooniverse, like, is there a penguin in this image? Yes or no? Uh, that's going to disappear. Um, but I think we're still a long way off uh, from seeing it truly being the machine taking on, on, on many of these different types of projects, being the machine taking all of the very easy kind of things uh, and leaving just the really difficult task for a human. That is one thing we have to address and think about is like, are we leaving really hard work for humans? And is that going to engage volunteers? You know, we'll still need the humans, but will they still want to help out if, if we're just relentlessly giving them hard tasks? But I think what we're seeing is sometimes it's not a harder task. Sometimes it's it's more interesting. Like on the Galaxy Zoo result, we thought that the, uh, the, the machine learning algorithm would be spitting out harder galaxies to classify, but it isn't actually, it's, it's spitting out more interesting ones, but humans are still so fantastically quick with their pattern recognition that um, that I think it's still not necessarily getting rid of the, the, the lower skill. Um, uh, but but it's giving almost more interesting data to look at. Uh, the example again of the the Zorilla problem. It's not it's not actually harder for us to look at a picture of a zebra and then look at a picture of a Zorilla and then go find those examples in, in data. But for a machine, that's that's so hard because they just don't have the training data on on one of them. But for us, it's still quite an easy task. So I still think there's a a large fraction of this uh, visual uh, data and pattern processing that isn't necessarily extremely hard, but is going to take a long time for machines to, to pick up on to the same ability as humans. 
Yeah, thank you, Grant. And I see actually there are lots of comments on this point also in the comments that uh, participants have been providing on the uh, questions that we have asked at the beginning. So this is probably a point that we can also pick up again in the in the chat with the other panelists later. Uh, just one last very quick question and then sure. we move on to the col uh, collective uh, uh, chat. Um, so there is someone asking, does the universe consider including the analysis of videos in the future? Uh, we already have. Um, yep. So, so the Zooniverse platform um, allows audio, video, data, and and, and image upload at, at the moment. So we have a few um, uh, video projects on there. Uh, go, go and have a look at Zooniverse.org, and you'll see that. Our, we, I think we've got about ninety live projects at the moment, and and, and a handful of of video projects on there. And if anyone wants to build. Uh, projects, then it's all completely uh, free and open, and you can go and upload your videos uh, and, and make your own project if that's if that's what you've got as well. We don't have any uh, video projects at the moment that I'm aware of that have incorporated machine learning into the into the loop. So that might be something interesting for for someone out there to work on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Grant. And I think we are perfectly on time uh, to start. Um, um, our discussion of uh, the poll results and all the comments that participants have been really kind in providing in the Google document. So along with Grant and myself, I would like to invite all the other panelists on the screen. I see you're all appearing there. That's fantastic. Um, so um, welcome here. And uh, I think we have quite a lot of interesting comments that have been uh, provided in the Google documents. Um, maybe we can start um, following on what has been commented by Grant on what it is also on these low skills that can be eventually replaced or not. And I see a lot of comments on that um, in the Google document. Uh, quite a lot of people are concerned about uh, not only um, what can be replaced uh, by artificial intelligence? Uh, so whether the what artificial intelligence can really do that, uh, but also the fact that it will take away tasks for humans, so that uh, um, it's uh, it's not uh, maybe that's not so good. Um, but also people are asking, even if that happens, and even if that happens in a meaningful way, is it is that really, uh, can we really call that democratizing uh, research? Um, so, um, and we will really have more time for more sophisticated jobs. So would you like, is it okay for you if we take this as a starting point to comment on, um, on, on the questions of the poll and what has been raised so far. I see some nodding. Okay, great. So would anyone like to, to go first, uh, sharing your point of view and add comments on this? I see Frank raising his hand. Yes, thank you, Marcia. Um, I wanted to comment on the democratization questions um, because indeed maybe in the short question it's not entirely clear what we meant by this and i hope i speak for my fellow panelists when i try to explain this a little bit but please correct me if you have a different opinion democratization in this context was supposed to mean that you as a citizen scientist will be enabled to do more than just contribute to existing projects right so if you have um, a machine learning environment and a trained model that indeed could enable you to do research which you couldn't do if you were entirely on your own right so by taking away some of those more routine tasks it could also enable you to delve into interesting questions which otherwise because of lack of resources wouldn't be available to you and i think that was the idea behind asking whether an ai can make research more democratic in the sense that you as a citizen can participate more and steer the research also more in directions that are interesting for you. I, I can say a word. 
the question of democratization of literature, the answers are quite interesting indeed because um, a lot of people seem to reject uh, or to don't know. So the number of people who don't know is quite interesting. It shows that these questions are really new and we are learning from, from that. Um, from our first, uh, very first researches on uh, uh, human learning and machine learning in citizen science, we know uh, exactly what Grant demonstrated brilliantly, that collaboration between humans and machines is the best way to achieve our scientific goals in citizen science. It's the most efficient way. But what, what we know also from the research in psychology um, and uh, learning in citizen science is that there are a lot of uh, psychological barriers to participation in citizen science projects, which are linked to the people thinking that they do not own the skills to participate in scientific projects. So uh, we see that a lot of people give up because they are not sure of the quality of what they provide, for example, as data in citizen science projects. So I think in, in this regard, um, I can understand the answers on democratization or non-democratization of research linked to the use of AI because people uh, might fear that uh, it increases the level of, um, of demand for participation to citizens if the easier jobs disappear. But on the other side, I can imagine that um, AI could support people's confidence in contributing to citizen science because we give appropriate feedbacks on their performance but we cannot give a scientist because we don't we can't follow every citizen and, and give uh, individualized appropriate feedback so um, and finally um, i think there is a point uh, which also is uh, uh, visible in the comments uh, in the google docs thank you for these fantastic comments which is about not only democratization of research, but also democratization of AI. So for me, this is maybe the, the point where Grant's talk is, uh, is uh, the most brilliantly demonstrating where we can go, because AI is everywhere in our everyday lives, but it's owned by commercial companies most of the time, okay? And so all this is completely black, it's closed. We can't see what's in the machine, in, in the motor. But this has a, a deep influence on our everyday lives. So uh, for me, one bet is that citizen science, because it's usually owned by public institutions, research groups, etc., it can open a little the box of artificial intelligence for people and help them understand how uh, all these algorithms are learning through their inputs and how all this is built. So, but with one condition, which is a very fundamental ethical condition for citizen science and artificial intelligence, which is exactly what uh, the universe is doing, which is transparency. Do you want to get the old version, the, the classical version, or do you want to contribute to machine learning? This is a very important step offering people the choice uh, and also uh, giving giving them some feedback on what is happening when they are using machine uh, when machine learning is used in citizen science projects may i thank you uh, yeah, brilliant. I would just like to follow up what what Laura just uh, just said, and also what Frank said. Um, I think there are at least three different, very interesting discussion uh, threads here. Um, on the one hand, indeed, um, the the spectrum uh, between this interface of citizen science and AI it's very wide, and Andrea just commented uh, that it's it's very much context dependent. So we do actually see a threat in AI taking away activities from uh, from people that they may actually enjoy doing. So this is one thing. Uh, on the other hand, it may empower people to do something they were never able to do. Um, and if we spin it further, uh, we may even discuss questions such as what happens if AI starts influencing the questions we are asking? Is this really the right thing? Should the mach How much should machines influence actually our questions and evolve, uh, involve, uh, be involved in our discussion and decision-making. I think there is a, a very, very interesting thread showing up. Um, but I very much also like uh, what Law brings to the table uh, and thanks to the comment on the Google Doc uh, as well, 
when it's really about democratizing AI. Um, and there was actually also a quote from, from uh, Jacob from the keynote yesterday. I think that's it's a very interesting setting looking into the citizen science community, which is actually very much value based and looking at inclusivity and looking at processes, how engaged, how to engage people. Uh, and with this perspective, I think we can very well research and it's a great opportunity to fill these concepts with more life. Uh, and these concepts uh, or the, the notions are human centered AI. Uh, AI for social goods and also explainable AI. Um, and these notions are more and more popping up also in, in the policy context. There is a European Commission white paper on artificial intelligence speaking a lot about people-centered AI. And I think in this realm, the citizen science community can bring quite a lot. Um, so basically how to interact with the human, uh, but also what does explainable AI mean and actually being transparent about the use of AI, but also the way it's working. Um, and this is the third part then of, of my intervention. Basically, then we have this third element of, of the ethical questions. Um, and this goes a bit to the risk question we had in the poll. Um, so what's basically uh, the accountability? Where is the accountability going? Uh, and we shouldn't drop this assumption that accountability is very important, but we also should really look into a new way of um, designing these processes and also asking the ethical questions with citizen science in a dynamic way. So there is also kind of a co-creation possibility uh, turning up with the citizen science community to start looking into into ethical questions in the interconnection between society and machines. Uh, and also this came up yesterday and it will be taken up tomorrow by one of the site events um, on ethical review boards. I think this is also another very interesting threat which just was inspired yesterday, but it also came in very strongly today. Thank you very much, Sven. And uh, maybe just as a reminder, uh, I would like to ask if we can have on the screen also the um, the, the outcomes uh, of the two questions that we asked in the poll, just to have a quick reminder of what we have, uh, of what people have been uh, answering. And um, I think also linking to this, so, so far we, we, are, we are looking a lot into democratization, different aspects of democratization and accountability. There are more comments in the, in the Google document that we can address, but first I think Grant, you wanted to address some of the questions that have been uh, coming up. Yeah, yeah, just um, also just wanted to say like after Sven there and Laura, like there's a clear, um message coming out a clear important discussion thread around like the visibility um of of machines in, in citizen science and if you're going to make it a collaboration making it a true collaboration you know um a, you know not hiding any of the machines in the background and in fact bringing them right to the to the foreground and and, and you know having that opportunity as you say to, to to actually teach people about what machines are doing um and to, to that point uh, James Sprinks had asked a question about, you know, we, we traditionally we train a machine um, by telling it what a human uh, has said, but, you know, do we do we train a human by telling it what a machine has said? Um, and I think, yeah, this is something that's of great interest. We, we discussed this idea as a possibility for the Galaxy Zoo workflow about whether we should put on the images uh how how confident the machine was about it we decided against that in this case but i think it's something we're gonna hopefully bring into projects in the future another thing about uh kind of getting through data faster with with machines and humans is 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 um you know our traditional model involves maybe you know 30 people giving an answer um on 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 an image but uh it, we're moving more towards the possibility that we'll have machines give the first kind of guess and then show those guesses to to humans and ask for some sort of confirmation. So in that case, it's actually the machine saying, hey, I think it's this, but like, uh, what do you think about it? And we can get then get people going through going through data like that in a, in a kind of faster way rather than having to give all the information from scratch. So I, 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 just, I just wanted to reiterate, I think there's something really important in this idea of, 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 of bringing it all into this kind of clear um, uh, collaboration without hiding any of the machines in the background. Yeah, thank you very much, Grant. And I, I, I would like to 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 focus 
again on something that I think is really important and is coming up a lot in the comments that we see in the in the Google document is that uh, whether it's AI or not taking care of some task, there is still someone behind it that kind of sets it up. So um, I think this um, links a lot with this uh, concept of with the, the concept of accountability, uh, but also with some comments that have just been raised by um, by Luigi saying that. Um, I think also the, the data management part that comes with it is also very important. So um, anonymity is uh, anonymity management is really important because through this process uh, we could be collecting some personal details or some personal data that uh, should not be retained. Um, so would anyone like to uh, to comment on these uh, aspects? So yes, there is still. Whether it's AI or not taking care of it, there are still humans behind it and there are still uh, human personal data involved. Uh, Laura, I see you have raised your hand. Very shortly, just to say that uh, um, I, I believe ethics is a very important topic for, for the future of AI in citizen science and for citizen, the future of citizen science in general. But I think there is a lot more to ethics than anonymity. Um, some of our participants just don't want to be anonymous. They want to be recognized. They want to be part of it. And what we need to think is the global ethics of a project. Citizen science has a good public image because it's helping scientists. So we should not disappoint them but by having um, over practices that are not going in that good direction. Well, I could elaborate a lot, but not here. Thank you, Laura. Would anyone else like to add something on this point or on any other point that we haven't touched so far? We have three minutes left. So, Marisa, did you raise your hands? Uh, you need to unmute yourself first. Oh, that's right. Can Perfect. you hear yes, me? Yes, now it's working. Thank you. No, it was something more related to what we were discussing just in relation to the first question. and. Uh, uh, the the issue of the low skill so personally for me it's very interesting trying to understand how the use of machine learning for example other forms of artificial intelligence in citizen science can bring about a redistribution of roles uh, and uh, of skills between uh, the two actors so this is something that i'm exploring right now and i'm not entirely sure so what's uh, what's going on so i don't have answers to that but this is something i think about uh, something will happen in this respect <clears throat> thank you marisa so we have two minutes left would anyone like to add something to this really interesting conversation we have been having i'm really sorry there are lots of questions we haven't managed to address but we will try to do so uh, once we get the text uh, from from the chat uh, see grants yes please. I, I think there, there was an interesting question from margaret gold um, talking about, you know, if we can take all of the easy images out, you know, if we can take all the pictures of zebras out, should we? Uh, and this is a really interesting ethical question. You know, if if you can show, and we have shown in, in some previous studies, the potential for um, certain images, for example, to, to engage people uh, more in a project and, and, and lead to them uh, uh, wanting to spend more time there. Um, if, if we can remove all of these images, uh, because a machine is so confident on them, then should we? Um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because, you know, we've always said at the universe, we don't want to waste any volunteer effort. Um, so if, if someone's answering an image that they don't need to be, then that's not great for citizen science. But, but by removing them, if you remove the enjoyment and the engagement of the volunteer on that project, is that worse than, than showing them something uh, or, or, or a few, a handful of things that they actually don't need to answer, and I think it's a, it's a great question, and I, I don't think we're even sure of, of the answer yet. But I'd love to actually hear the perspective of the citizen scientists themselves on on that question going forward. That's great. Thank you very much, Grant. I think our time is over. It's uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Central European time, but uh, I would like to really thank very much all the participants. 
Uh, the interaction has been really interesting. We have um, a lot of questions that we would like to address further. Um, and also, I would like to give a big thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for, and also to, to the technical service. Thank you very much for bearing with us and supporting us in this uh, complex sessions session that we have set up. So I wish you all a nice lunch or whatever meal that you're going to have in whatever part of the world you are. And um, have a good uh, sessions this afternoon with the EXA conference. Thank you very much and bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See Thank ya. you. Bye bye. Bye bye.